Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. In our previous lecture, we talked about President Warren G. Harding, some of his personal qualities and background prior to becoming president. And in this lecture, we're going to continue with that discussion, talking about some of the specific events and policies of Harding's presidency, and on the whole, how his presidency is viewed by historians. At the end of the previous lecture, I talked about some of the policies that Warren G. Harding advocated uh, as he became president. Things like wanting to put our own house in order, uh, increasing tariff barriers, lowering domestic taxes, uh, helping uh, farmers, and an anti-lynching law. So what does the record tell us about Harding's accomplishments? Well, certainly the record on such things is mixed. Harding did put many things on the plate of Congress, and Congress remained in almost continuous session from April 1921 to September 1922 to contemplate his many ideas. In June of 1921, Congress did pass the Budget and Accounting Act, establishing a national budget and streamlining the budget process. Also under Harding, the United States finally signed a separate peace officially ending its war with Germany and Austria. Congress also passed a series of acts to help farmers, regulating contracts, increasing the size of loans, and protecting farm cooperatives from antitrust laws. Congress also twice increased the tariff under Harding to protect domestic products, and the Immigration Act of 1921, which we discussed in some previous lectures. Finally, Harding also pardoned Eugene V. Debs, who had been jailed under Woodrow Wilson for un-American activities, and he granted a general pardon of other political prisoners from the Red Scare period, helping to ease the tensions of that very difficult time, which again we discussed in some previous lectures. So Harding does notch some accomplishments in that first year or so of his administration. But everything was not roses during that first year. Uh, there were major strikes across the country, as I discussed in previous lectures, and he allowed his attorney general, Doherty, to break those strikes viciously. He also refused to support a soldier's bonus bill for the veterans of World War I, which he vetoed just a few days before the midterm elections of 1922. Those elections didn't go especially well for Harding, who saw Republican majorities in both the House and the Senate decline after those elections. He also was never successful in attaining an anti-lynching law, and in fact, racial unrest was high during his presidency. And finally, I mentioned some of the criticisms of his personal failings, um, particularly in enforcing prohibition, which drew criticism during that time. By August of 1923, Harding expressed that he was feeling tired. He seemed depressed and stressed out. Pushing all these various programs was stressful and tiring. But also Harding seemed to sense that some of the scandals swirling about his administration were going to come to light. He once commented to the National Press Club, I never find myself done. I don't believe there's a human being who can do all the work there is to be done in the president's office. It seems as though I've been president for 20 years. Harding had private issues as well. His wife became ill in the fall of 1922. Then Harding himself had a bad flu in January 1923. By the spring of 1923, he appeared pale and weak, not his jovial self. In addition, that spring, rumors of a variety of scandals were beginning to surface. Charles Forbes, the director of the Veterans Bureau, had been illegally selling government supplies from the medical supply base to private contractors at ridiculously low prices. Upon hearing these rumors, Harding called Forbes to the White House and grabbed him by the throat and shouted at him, You double-crossing bastard! Forbes was sub subsequently sent to Europe, where he resigned. 
one of Forbes' accomplices, named Charles F. Kramer, committed suicide on March 14th, shooting himself in the head. Another of Harding's cronies killed himself ten weeks later, Jess W. Smith. Smith was Harry Doherty's personal secretary. He was also involved in a number of scams, including granting paroles, selling liquor licenses, and various other fixes. Helping Smith was a small group of petty scoundrels that came to be called the Ohio Gang. You see the Ohio Gang pictured here. They used a little house on K Street as their headquarters. Now, historians remain uncertain how much and how many of these activities Harding knew about. But he was heard having an argument with Smith the day before his suicide. In June of 1923, Harding decided to take a trip to Alaska. He thought it might do him some good to get away from Washington. Before leaving, Harding sold the Marion Star newspaper, and the suicides and scandal rumors hung over him throughout the trip. He seemed to improve a bit on the first few weeks of the trip, but as the ship began to head back towards home, his condition worsened again. He was increasingly nervous and depressed. At one point, he asked Hoover what he should do if he knew of a scandal brewing. Hoover told him, publish it and retain integrity, and then asked for details. But Harding changed the subject and left it at that. By the ship's return to Vancouver on the 26th of July, the president was weak and morose and complained of chest pains. On August 2nd, he suffered instant death from massive heart failure. Upon his death, Harding would seem to have been one of our most popular presidents. Tens of thousands of mourners attended the funeral, with hundreds of thousands lining the roads of the procession. But the scandals to ruin his presidency only came out later. The biggest of these scandals is known as the Teapot Dome Scandal. It involved Secretary of Interior Albert Fall, who transferred oil reserve land the most famous being the Teapot Dome in Wyoming, from the Navy Department to the Department of Interior, where they were then leased to two oil men, Harry Sinclair and Edward Doheny, without competitive bids. Fall was convicted of fraud and bribery, sentenced to a year in jail and fined $100,000. More sensational was the trial of Harry Doherty and his cronies, Doherty was connected with the Ohio gang on many schemes. A fortuitous fire destroyed the records in the Washington courthouse and eliminated the evidence against him. Nonetheless, there were tales of wild orgies and parties at the house on K Street, and Harding himself was implicated by some witnesses. Doherty was ultimately acquitted for lack of sufficient evidence, but Harding's reputation was seriously smeared by the rumors. And finally, there were the personal scandals. In 1927, a book was published by Nan Britton called The President's Daughter. Britton was much younger than the president by about 30 years. She claimed in the book to have had an affair with Harding while he was senator and even president. There were tales of sex in the closet in the Oval Office and that she fathered a child by him. He also carried on an affair with a woman named Miss Carrie Phillips, a Marian woman and wife of the town's leading businessman, for some 15 years. So again, his reputation seriously suffered from these kind of personal scandals, and they've certainly dragged down his legacy and how he is viewed by historians. So what do we make of that legacy? Well, again, his presidency did accomplish some noteworthy things. But they've been overwhelmed in history by the poor appointments and the many scandals surrounding his presidency. For the rest of the 1920s and much of the 20th century, he was actually known as an embarrassment and a burden to the legacy of the Republican Party. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about Harding's successor in the White House, Calvin Coolidge, who actually spent a good bit of the early part of his presidency 
trying to overcome the many scandals remaining from Harding's 